Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon, guys. Uh, thank you for taking your time out and joining me here in this session. Uh, my name is Anupama Tirvaipati, and I am a senior software engineer at Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a global finance and a media company. Uh, it provides real-time finance data, news, and analysis to professionals across various industries. I am part of AIM. AIM stands for Asset and Investment Manager. Uh, for buy-side firms, uh, we provide multi-asset solutions, such as portfolio management, compliance, trading, and other operations. We are uh, enterprise scale. We operate at enterprise scale, but we also maintain an agility. That's, that's us. So that's about me and my company in a nutshell. Today, I'm here to talk about the power of specification testing, uh, adding functional requirement to unit testing. Let's start with behavior-driven development, BDD. We all love BDD. In the ever-evolving era of software engineering, delivering a product which meets user expectations is a must. BDD helps us to achieve this goal efficiently. The principles of BDD uh, bridges the gap between stakeholders, developers, and testers by fostering clear communication, sharing knowledge, and better understanding. I will take you through the rest of the slides using this example. Consider that you have this gigantic trade booking application, which does many, many things. And now we have received a new requirement, enabling short selling. <coughs> Here on the screen, you can see the financial definition of a short selling, but I'm going to give you a simple one. Short selling is you trying to sell something that you don't have. I'll repeat myself. Short selling is you trying to sell something that you don't have. How? You borrow it. You borrow, you sell, you buy back, and pay it back. The key idea here is you trying to bet uh, that the prices are going to go low in the future. And that's how you make the profit. OK, so let's try to apply our BDD principles to this requirement. Here are a few of the scenarios for the requirement. The first scenario, successfully borrowed stocks. Consider user initiated a trade booking. It get books. User sees a successful green message on the screen, a happy case. So two things happened over here. First, as a user was a user had like you know found a borrower. Next, is they had the sufficient funds. So the next scenario is unsuccessful borrowing due to insufficient funds. User again initiates a trade booking. It gets rejected, and this time user should see an error pop up message saying cannot book the trade due to insufficient funds. And the third scenario is can't find a counterparty to borrow from. That means like, you know, user again initiates a trade booking, gets rejected because user could not find a borrower. So the last two scenarios are the failure scenarios, but then the error messages are different. So these are some scenarios that we're gonna see in the in the you know how we can implement and more. Here's our beautiful trade booking, uh, booking architecture. Uh, we have our sh short trade booking service, which is dependent upon many things, such as trader info, stocks info, real market data, and much more. The real system is much more complex than this. However, for the sake of simplicity, we shall only focus on the trade booking engine. Here's our trade booking engine. We have a lot of APIs, which eventually hits this part of the code. That is validate and book. Validate and book function essentially calls two more functions, that is validate request and book trade. 
they both have their own implementation. But if you look at the validate request, it does things like validate security, validate user, validate stock, and more. Everything looks good. We have our trade booking system. We have successfully added the short selling you know, feature to it. It is enabled. All the scenarios are covered. Everything is good. Our users are happy. Now, let's take a look at the trade booking engine's unit test. Here are some of the sample. So we have test validate price, test valid quantity to sell, test stock exists in the market, and few more. We have also parameterized our tests to cover all the permutations, such as uh, on the test validate price, we are checking price with positive, negative, and a zero value. Good, we have you know, a good coverage. Let me ask you a question. Which user workflows are we testing with these unit tests? That means by looking at these unit tests, can you guess the user workflows? The answer is not too clear. The reason is our unit tests are only talking about what they are doing, but it's not about the user behavior. Our end goal is to ensure the system behaves as the user expects it to be. And the unit tests lack in expressing this user behavior. Few more questions. What happens if the stock does not exist? What state changes in the system if a trade was booked successfully? Can we answer these questions by looking at the unit test? The answer is, again, not too clear. This time, because they are lacking the specificity. They are only talking about the implemented code, but not the intent. We would like to use our unit test to document the code's intent. Moving on. <laughs> One fine day, an uh, engineer had time to refactor. What was the refactoring? They moved the user validation logic into a new module. Now, what happens to the unit tests which are using the user validation logic? Now we have to go back and update by mocking it. Here's a sample. We have like test user is valid trader, and you would write something like this. The question is, if I'm changing all the unit tests because I updated the code, how would that protect me from the regression defects? So this question is something that even we ask in our teams before we actually pick up any of the refactoring work slash stories slash tasks, you can say anything, is we see the impact of the refactoring on the unit test. We cater for that. We see if there is an impact, if there's not. We do a proper analysis. So, so yeah, three issues. Now, imagine if you had test that covers the required behavior, acts as the documentation of the code's intent, and protects us from the refactoring. That means some way the test would talk about the BDD acceptance scenarios, uh, very specific enough, and decouples from the implementation. So any test which is providing, having all of these three qualities, we call that as a specification test. Let's revisit our trade booking engine and write some specification test. Here's a sample. Test trader short sell with insufficient funds returns an error message to user. This is the second scenario that we have seen earlier. User initiates a trade booking, it gets rejected, and they see an error message saying the insufficient funds cannot book. This test talks about two of the qualities that I have just spoke. First, it's very specific. It's talking about to test the error message that the user is seeing. 
and it talks about the behavior, the user workflow, the user behavior here. Coming to the point number three, how spec test helps us with the refactoring is this. This is our trade booking engines diagram, right? So we often write our unit test quite low. That is the smallest function or the smallest unit of your system, you write it for that, for example, here. So we have our validate security, validate user, validate stocks, much more, right? You write the unit test entry point is here. Whereas the specification tests are written above it. They are on a higher level. You need to find a level where you can actually form a user behavior, and that's when you can write it out. So since they are on a higher level, it's, it's not impacted by the refactoring. The specification test matters about like what's an input and what's going out rather than what's happening in the middle. So, so yeah. And to be honest, like when we were initially implementing the specification testing, we had a challenge at this point because we had to shift our traditional unit testing, you know, thinking to, to specification testing. We had to uh, see on a higher scale and, and then form it over there. And also like, uh, if you're doing a, like a new testing, you need to have the setup. So obviously there's one time effort that we had to do and understand. So that challenges with that. Let's see some more specification test. Test trader successfully borrows stock, so the trade ID is generated. This is the first successful BDD scenario where it's a happy case, it was successful, and user sees a message. But with the message, there will be a trade ID generated because it's a successful, right? So this test is talking about that bit, where the trade ID is generated or not. Let's look at the bottom two tests. First is the test unknown trader not allowed to sell, so error code 12 is shown to the user. Next, the test unknown trader not allowed to sell, so error message with the trader ID is shown to the user. Both the tests are quite similar because they both are talking about the same scenario, except what they are trying to test. That is, one is talking about the error code, is 12 is shown or not, and the other is talking about the error message. And we wanted something like this. And specification test actually helped, uh, helped our teams in many ways, which as first is it was easy to read, and that helped us to have uh, effective conversations with the product team. We could literally pull this up and then talk with them about the, the scenarios and the behaviors, what can you know, go wrong or which is correct. Second, when we started writing the specification test, we found uh, in one of the surveys like there was an undocumented behavior because now you have to check what you need to test at the end or output at the end of each test, right? So when we were trying to do that, we found that there was one piece of code getting executed all the time and we had no clue. So obviously we, uh, we checked and we, we did what correct thing has to, do, to be done. Next is I feel like often engineers, uh, they understand the acceptance level or the acceptance criteria of a requirement. If you have to deal, like if the request and the response deals with 100 fields or they place around with 100 fields, as an engineer, you may not know the importance of all the 100 fields. Again, there was like one time when we were writing the spec test, we found a conflicting behavior for one of the fields and we had no clue. So we reached out to our product team, we discussed what is the right behavior and what's the right value should be going there, and we fixed it. So these are like the tiny takeaways and the learnings and that helped our team to, you know, uh, with this kind of testing strategy. Some key takeaways. Specification testing focuses on the testing the behavior and functionality of the software from the user's perspective. It helps identify and prevent integration issues early on by testing the interactions between the modules. If you write spec test before you implement or before writing your actual code, it will decouple the implementation for sure. And it will also help us to write or be on the right path of 
effectively implementing TDD, that is test-driven development. You can always write unit test. We are not, never saying not to write. If you ever find a piece of code which is missing out or not getting tested by specification test, which usually is not the case, but still, to be more assured and be more confident and have like a better coverage, you can always go ahead and write the unit test. That's always a tool for you. The main reason that we moved to specification testing was the efficiency. We felt somewhere that the efficiency could be done better. Our quality was great. It was always good. And we wanted to be faster enough. We didn't want to wait for longer time to tell our test suit to what went wrong. You know, yeah, uh, that is nothing but the feedback loop. We wanted to do the refactoring uh, work quickly. We didn't want to update all our tests. We wanted our tests to be very specific and readable. And you know what, six months uh, later, if you look at the test, you have no clue what's, what went wrong or in your documentation is old. We didn't want to uh, fall into all of these issues and this was a good solution for us and worked out. Next is the specification test act as a living documentation, providing clear and comprehensive examples of how the software should behave. Last but not the least, establishes the robust B feedback loop, providing early and continuous feedback on the software behavior. So we all know that the, the testing triangle, right? At the bottom layer, you have the unit test, then the integration test, and at the top, you have the system level test. So it's often said like at the bottom you have like many, many tests. That's why you have a lot of unit tests and a few system level tests. As you go further on the top of the triangle, there'll be fewer. And the time taken to run this test is actually the reverse. That is, the unit test runs faster, and if you go towards the top of the triangle, it is slower and slower. Our goal was to do something on the bottom tier, where it's faster and yet, you know, testable, readable, and more efficient for us. And yeah, definitely this, this was our journey, and you know, it was a successful journey. Uh, yeah, that's a wrap from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was very insightful. So if you have any questions, you could move to the microphone and kindly ask. She's psyched to answer. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about testing more complex or complex systems when you could have like multiple microservices working together. So I wonder how we can do that kind of testing in this kind of scenario when you, like kind of like what, what would you do when you have like interact with five microservices to test some scenario or to process some events, messages, how to solve this kind of situation? Would you have to like mock everything but then it's not like really testing in the end, mm. right? That's a good question. Uh, so yes, like uh, that is something that we do on day-to-day -day basis. But the thing is, if you actually want to uh, do a proper scenario, like end-to-end, -end, like where your request is flowing all the five services and you want to see the responses and how it works, that's basically a system-level test. If you want to do actual hitting to all the microservices, that's the top of the triangle that I was just talking about. The specification test that we went uh, was for the bottom tier, that is on the each service level. We are still mocking out, yes. If there are multiple services included in it, we have to mock it out. But the question is, at which level and to what extent? That was the question. Because we again have interaction uh, test, and you, 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 we all have like the testing suits that run on, you create a PR versus like the nightly runs and everything, right? It's just a matter of that, where do you want to do the changes and when, how fast you want the results? So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, there's someone else over there, yeah. So in our, in our project, we implement specification tests um, like in Cucumber, so in a natural language, as a natural mm. language test. And we find it really readable 
Mm -hmm. So it's really a living documentation. Yes. Uh, it's clear, it's comprehensive, it's good to communicate with the stakeholders. Uh, but your specification tests, do you implement them like with PyTests, right? So these are just basically yes. PyTest tests, yeah. And do you have this Cucumber also or something similar? We have uh, Behave. Uh, Behave. I think yeah, we, we yeah, use yeah. Behave for our integration test, mm -hmm. but then... I think, yes, like uh, when we did the specification test, like in our services, definitely we did it in Python. Mm -hmm. And not too fancy, but like something what you have seen, a bit more complex with our mm -hmm. actual things. <laughs> okay, I see. Yeah. So we have also this level, so to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you talk about functional um, or spec testing, yeah. Um, so you know I've, I've been in the industry for a long time. So we used to do unit test, functional test, module test, <laughs> system test, and finally non-functional testing and in integration testing. And still, banks do do many of them, mm. um, and they're done by specific testers, right? Mm. So a developer doesn't have to spend so much time um, on testing. You just have to think about test coverage. I think when you're talking about spec test, yeah. you're basically um, giving away the coverage and more focusing on the functionality uh, without having to test the external systems. Mm -hmm. Is that the right understanding? Uh, a bit more than yes, but one thing is that we are not giving away on the coverage. We still have a really good coverage. I'll tell you the reason. If you take the same scenario about the, the happy case or the unhappy case where the things were failing, you were eventually hitting all those things. It's just that you're not exclusively calling the valid user or the valid stock. But if you say this, uh, like valid and book this particular stock or whatever, if you say Apple, your code will eventually flow in that, di in, in that way. So your coverage is still there with the specification test. But I think, uh, it, like you said, you have been in the industry, and slowly the standards have been changing. Uh, yes, there was once upon a time we had like a proper Q&A team who would do actual testing, and we still do that. We still have our own Q&A team. But then it's more about the readability aspect as well. Because in finance, things are really complex, and we are, so <laughs> we are software engineers. <laughs> and so to bridge the gap, and to enhance ourselves and not to be lost all the time of what we did a year ago or six months ago or three months ago, this was really good. Or someone who's like newly joined our team, if we want to explain them what we are doing, it was next to impossible, unless until they have like a good grip on the finance. But we still did that even before the specification testing. We had our documentation, everything, but that is not the case in most of the time. So with this, it will be really easy, you know? So that was the holy. We still have our good coverage, but we are trying to do better in our aspect. We still have the Q&A, all, all the testing, that they are there. Yes, yes. Sure. Hello, thank you for your lecture. And uh, I wanted to ask you, how often do you mock some stuff in those spec tests? Because as far as I understood, uh, if you do a lot of mocking in those uh, spec tests, uh, then uh, those spec tests can become another type of unit tests that basically do not test anything. So just uh, want to know maybe from your practice if uh, there is some kind of a rule of thumb uh, how not to give a lot of those mocks and uh, stuff. So, hope this is understandable. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I understood like what you're trying to ask. So I'll tell you from our experiences that when, so basically for us, there is obviously, to some extent we are mocking because I'm not saying we are actually hitting all the other services, no. We are mocking, but they are a bit higher levels, so you need to define your interface as well. I mean, your system needs to be pretty good. Only then your specification test journey is going to be easy. Or else you're going to have a lot of troubles defining where to add this or where should your entry point be. 
So, so that's actually altogether a different aspect. That's a different talk about the interfaces, how clean it should be, how good it should be. What, uh, like, that was like the one thumb rule uh, where your services should have good implementation or, or the designing. Uh, I think, yeah, that you can see. Okay. Think we have a few more minutes or done? Five more minutes. Cool. Uh, no more questions? Cool. Thank you for your time, guys.